up fam welcome to the living for you the youtube channel it's me it's just dr larry today and i wanted to get on here and have a conversation because all of you know we need to have a conversation and because the conversation is serious i decided to kind of tone it down and go into kind of as minimalist as i possibly could go into you guys know what i'm talking about i'm talking about that situation in which trump supporters looted and rioted and broke into the nation's capital over the loss of an election. But before we get into all that from a life coach's perspective, I want to go ahead and remind you that I am Dr. Larry Smith. I'm a certified life coach. Um, I'm certified life and spiritual coach amongst other things. I'm also a historian. I went to college for history. I'm also a theologian. So many of my, I guess you would say, titles or hats that I wear are fully applicable to have this type of discussion right here today. Um, if you want to know more about me, you can go to www.liveforyoucoaching.com. That's www.liveforyoucoaching.com. You can also follow me on social media at Dr. Larry Smith on Instagram and on Facebook. So let's get into it. So I know when, you know, I wanted my first message for the year to be something upbeat, you know, to kind of get us gear and get us going and ready to set and to accomplish our goals for the year. That is always what we generally do. But this year, it seemed as though some of 2020's mess spilled over into 2021 because not that long at the beginning of the year, just last week, armed, stormed, riled up Trump supporters decided that they were going to break into and budge their way into the national capital, the nation's capital, in order of protest to prevent the certification of the election ballots from the different states of now elected Joe Biden as president. And it, 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 it seemed pretty unreal because the last time anybody stormed into the nation's capital was literally in 1812, in the War of 1812 when the British did it. Normally that's a heavily secure building because that's where all the lawmakers, the Senate and the Congress is. So it's heavily secure, but they managed to get themselves in there and they did all kinds of damage. And of course I'll put different pictures up throughout so that you can see the damage and, and see what happened. And it just was a complete scene of chaos because the government, at least that aspect of the government had to shut down. Um, so that this can be rectified and eventually they were able to get the people out But I think by the end of it some of them were injured I think it was like either f I want to say five six people who were killed in this situation police officers beaten um, And it just was an all-out embarrassing situation for the nation But it was also kind of a scary situation for the nation and a lot of the media outlets and my own personal belief is this was an act of terrorism this was an act of aggression against the nation, so it was also treasonous. It was an act in order to get what someone want by using terroristic methods. You know, had it been now, now, now on the reality, because you know we speak real here, if it had been uh, people of color, black people, Hispanic people, Native Americans, people from the Middle or the Near East, um, Asian people, it more more likely that the outpour of it would have been considered these were terrorists. But these were mostly a group of white individuals who was storming into um, the capital. Uh, people of all kinds. There were people of different uh, political, well, people of, of certain who worked in the government. I think in one state it was a representative who was there. It was business owners. It was former soldiers. One of the people who was killed was a woman who was a former soldier. Um, it was just kind of just a chaos mix of different people who were there protesting a duly elected official. Now the problem is it, <laughs> it stems from our president now, who is Donald Trump, who since before the election already started to perpetuate the narrative that there was going to be election fraud. So he was putting it in the atmosphere. He kept saying it, he kept tweeting it, he kept talking about it. And what happens is we know that this man already, given since 2016, has developed a cult following. I mean, of almost rabid followers who are willing to do and ignore everything he does and do whatever he says do. And so he was building it in their minds that there was genuinely going to be election fraud. So when the election happened, it just was like, and it wasn't in his favor. Um, 
he they automatically assumed it was election fraud and it made a lot of people mad because the election had huge numbers. This was the most people to vote in an election in U.S. history. Uh, where Joe Biden got over 70 million, Donald Trump got over 70 million people. And it was uh, Joe Biden won by over 4 million people more. And he won all the electric, electoral college votes. So at the end of the day, it was a landslide win for Joe Biden. And all at the same time, even Monday when all of this was, or Tuesday when all this was occurring, we was also having kind of like the remnants of it, where in Georgia we had a Senate race in which uh, 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 John Ossoff and uh, Reverend Warnock, Warnock actually won the election in Georgia. So Georgia went completely blue this election cycle, something that hadn't happened since the 90s, the early 90s, 92. And so... It, 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 so and and go and and, and uh, Senator now elected newly Senator Warnock becomes the first African American in the state of Georgia to become a senator. So there so there's history being made. There's things that are changing. Uh, Ossoff is the first millennial in Congress. There's a lot there's a lot of things that are occurring in this election cycle. So it was a duly ele elected uh, election. Um, it was a positive feeling for those of us who were over the heaviness that 2021, 2020 was. 2020 was a lot. You know, we had the pandemic that hit. We had massive death from it. We had unemployment and job loss and people struggling. We had negative rhetoric. We had the George Floyd and the Breonna Taylors and, and the Aubrey Autry situations that were happening, the protests throughout the summer. So 2020 was a heavy and intense year for a lot of people. I know I stayed meditated and, and prayed up to kind of pure it out of myself because it was such a difficult thing. So of course, everybody going into 2021 was like, yes, we get a new fresh start. We got a new president. We got a new situation. This is going to move us into somewhere forward. And then we get this happening. Now, from a historical perspective, because I want to talk from my different perspectives, right? I'll, I'll start with the historical, then I'll go into the life coaching, <laughs> and then I'll end it from a theological, spiritual, if you want to say perspective. So there's something in this for everybody in this conversation that we're having. All right, so from a historical perspective, there's many dynamics that are happening here. Um, you have the, the white rage, <laughs> I'll, I'll call it what it is. And there's actually a good book called White Rage that you should look up, but there's angry white people who feel as though because of all of the changes in, in the country, in civil rights, in justice, and all kinds of other things, there are white people who feel as though something of theirs is being taken away. Now, mind you, this has been something that's been stirring and brewing in the pot really since the 1960s, because prior to the 1960s, the 1950s and, be and back, um, rights weren't equal. And it was just accepted across the board, across the country, uh, that equality, inequality was just what it is. And there were those who are entitled to certain things and then there were those who, who weren't. Black and whites generally live separate lives. Yes, it was most dramatic in the Southern states, but the reality of it is due to housing covenants, due to uh, state, state and city ordinances, due to socially personal decisions, black and white people generally didn't live next to each other or white people and people of color generally didn't live next to each other, even in Northern cities and in California and in Western cities and Arizona and places like that. So it was just commonplace that there was a, there were two divided Americas and there was one that was full of freedom and privilege and all of the stuff that we talk about, all men are created equal from the foundation of this country. And then there were others who didn't get involved and didn't have anything to do with that and were actually struggling. And so through the 1950s and 60s, you guys know the civil rights movement. It wasn't just a civil rights movement about race and ethnicity. It was also a civil rights movement for women and getting their right. It was also a civil rights movement for, um, um, uh, for many different groups, Native Americans, Jewish people, um, LBGTQ+. It was a civil rights movement for so many different groups. And then at the same time, you had the anti-war movement that was also a pro-peace movement that was happening at the same time. So with all of that, this was making this country drastically different than it had ever been since the founding. The last time we've seen any drastic different changes of this magnitude had been in the 1860s with the aftermath of the Civil War. So this was a massive move. 
And so from the 1960s onward, there had been kind of an underlining message that was reaching its way to white America, that something that was yours is being taken away from you and you got to protect it with all costs, at all costs, with all your might, however, by any means necessary. The Republican Party bought into that narrative and began to advocate that narrative to white people, in particularly to white Southerners, but it's going to spill over, like I said, into the West and to other places. And that's called the Southern Strategy, those of you who want to know a little bit more about that, Google Southern Strategy, and you can definitely see that it was an actual specific targeted campaign to Southern races or Southern Dixiecrats or Southern old school Southerners who hadn't got over the Civil War and who still believed in segregation and racist policies of Jim Crow. Um, they targeted them at, in an attempt to gain their votes. And that's when you begin to see the switch between Republicans supporting majority white and then everybody else pretty much who didn't agree with that were voting Democrat, including the African-American vote. So um, that's when that happened. So like I said, it's been brewing. So there's been an undercurrent of white anger. There's been an undercurrent of white insecurity. There's been an undercurrent of white fear. And, and a lot of politicians had played into that for a very long time. And when it comes to Donald Trump, that's what got him elected in 2016, because we're in a moment where we had an elected president who was an African-American, uh, a, a man of African descent, and Barack Obama. And that had never happened in this country. Barack Obama, as you guys know, was the first African-American or African descendant president. And so that, that change, plus the changes he was doing and, and how the country was viewing that and different things, just led to a boiling pot of fear insecurity and so many other things and then when you couple that on top of the push for equal justice against police brutality and police killings economic inequality health inequality education inequality inequality in the criminal justice system yada 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 and people fighting against that what it looks like to my white americans and i can't speak as a white american but i can speak from what students have told me i can speak from what people have told me questions I've had as I talk to people, interview people, is that there, there came to be a situation in which white people felt attacked. So not only are they feeling like they're losing something, they're feeling insecure, they're feeling angry, and they're, because they feel like they're also being attacked at the same time, simply for being white. And that goes to the conversation about white privilege and what it is. Many people, including many white people, don't understand what white privilege is. However, they benefit from it, but they don't really quite understand how it works. And, and, and that's a whole nother dialogue in itself, right? So um, all of that's happening. And so this situation historically, um, you, it, it had a, a beginning and as it just continued to boil over. Something else historically that I also think is very important is the idea of mass destruction or mass rioting or, or, or mass protests uh, uh, happening. In, in, in such a violent way. The beginning of the country's history with the American Revolution, the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, the, the situation there, that is how this country got its founding in a violent mass movement. And we've had violent mass movements throughout where we had labor revolts, where we had race riots, many, many race riots. Look up 1919, Red Summer. You can see we had many, many race riots. Um, We've had wars, we've had situation, a civil war. So we've had times in which there's been violent movements going on in this country. And then at the underpinning, you got insurgent movements like, like different groups, like neo-Nazi groups and other groups that are underneath white supremacist groups that are underneath the underpinning of all of this. So it is commonplace from the very beginning, historically in this country, to have massive moves of white violence. A lot of times when I hear people say things, when you talk about black, on, when you talk about uh, police brutality and police killings, a lot of times people say, but what about the violence in Chicago? Yes, there's violence in Chicago. Yes, there's gang violence in certain other places. Yes, that exists, but, this but that's not abnormal to this country. This country is a violent nation. It was founded on violence and that just is the way it is. It's, our, it's, it's part of, how we came to be. So all of this has historical precedence, right? 
this, this, this rejection, this independent spirit, all men are created equal, individual rights, you know, all these things, feeling like you own something, you know, like the country is yours, that it's yours, and, and no one else has a right to be here but you. Even though natives were here first, even though Africans were brought here against their will, none of that matters, right? None of that matters, because what it's about is individual rights. And if I feel like my I, <laughs> me, is under attack, then I get defensive. I call generation, uh, pretty much generation Y and the millennials beyond to now, the I generation, because everybody's about I, 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 iPhone, iPad, mine, me, me, me. And everybody wants to be heard, but not too many people want to listen. But like I said, all of this is historical built up. There is historical precedence for all of it. All right, so that's the historical element of it. And there's so many other sociological, economic things that you can put into that. And like I said, there's many resources out there. Um, I, I maybe even include resources in, in the, the, the uh, underneath the video so you guys can look up some stuff too. So everything I'm saying is factual just because I'm a historian. And so of course, <laughs> I, I, I look at all of the history from an objective perspective. So hopefully that blessed you <laughs> historically to get your mind thrown. So, um, but on the, the, on the life coach's perspective, the selfish nature of putting you first and not really accepting reality for what it is. You guys know that one of my biggest things that I help my clients with, that I work on myself and that I get on here and I talk to you all the time about is acceptance of what is. You can't change what is. You have to just deal with what is for what it is and not try to see it in any other kind of way. What I noticed even before this election and then even after the election that a lot of Trump supporters just refuse to embrace and accept that Trump lost the election. It was like you would talk to some of these people and they would say things like, well, it, that's all going to change. Trump's going to be president in 2020. They had convinced themselves way back in 2018, 2019, that Trump was going to be president. And even though reality made that Trump didn't win, they still weren't ready to con con concede that. So they were trying to, to not accept what was. What also is something that is along that same line is the changing dynamics of the country. A country that does not change does not evolve. And if there is no involvement, then it dies. It's the same thing with us. If you stayed a baby all your life, you would die. And I actually think there is a disease in which somebody is in an infantile state all their lives and they don't live long. Why? Because you have to evolve and adapt to be able to survive. And nations are micro or, or organisms just like humans have organisms, just like anything has an organism. So nations are organisms that operates and have to change and things change. Nothing stays the same. And when, what happens is when people get stuck in sameness, and you notice in your own life, when we get stuck in sameness and we're unable to shift and adapt, life can be very, very, very hard. And this is why I tell people all the time, you have to be on go for change. You have to be wide open for change because you never know when that current of change might come your way and you have to be able to be flexible enough mutable enough to adapt to it or else you're going to be very 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 uncomfortable um and we uh the, the saying goes that you don't go towards the current you ride with the current you don't try to go against it you ride with it because you're going to lose either way and change is a big wave a big wave you're not going to stop change <laughs> no matter how much you want to no matter how much you desire to, no matter how much you try to, you will never, ever, ever stop evolution. You will never, ever, ever stop change. That is just the way it is. And so in order for you to have the happiness, the contentment, and the peace within, you have to learn how to embrace and accept change. And so what we see here happening is an unwillingness to accept what is and an unwillingness to adapt to change to adapt, to grow. And then lastly, we see kind of this situation in which everything revolves around my personal experiences. Not listening to nobody else, don't care about anybody else's feelings, don't care about anybody else's thoughts, it's just what I want. 
That is a very unhealthy way to think. Because what happens is, is that's your attempt to try to impose your will onto somebody else. People are not going to do what you want them to do. You have to let people live and let people exist as they are and accept them as they are. The world doesn't center around us. It just doesn't. <laughs> we have to be able to, to accept people and life the way it is. Life is so much more fulfilling when, it, when we accept. Life is so much more fulfilling when we are open and willing to change. You are shackled when you try to stay stuck where you are. There's nothing, yes, there's com comfort there, but there's only comfort because you're not having to, 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 to put in effort. But after a certain point, being stuck where you are gets uncomfortable because you grow. So whether or not, uh, the, whether or not you decide to grow, you're going to grow anyway. And so eventually where you are will be uncomfortable if you do not grow beyond it. So from a life coach's perspective, there are some serious self-centered isms and inabilities to accept what is and to embrace change here that led to these people marching in and going in and breaking into and busting their way through the nation's capital. And you're like, is it that deep? It was an election. There'll be another one in four years. There'll be a uh, midterm in two. Is it really that deep? What are you trying to hold on to that you think nobody else wants? Because we're all human. We're all the same. We all breathe, believe the exact same way. We have the same motives at the core. We're all the same. And that leads me into the spiritual aspect of all of this. One of the things I had to tell myself constantly all last year with the pandemic, with how people were acting and treating each other, with the situation of the protests about police killings and the racism that I experienced myself on Facebook and, so, and social media and, and watching our president say things and people say things publicly and just a bunch of toxicity that was just negative. And it affected my spirit. Yeah, I'm honest, right? It affected my spirit. My spirit was affected by all of this. I was grieved in my spirit. But one of the things that I've learned because I've worked so hard at bettering my spiritual life is that when it's that heavy, go harder in your spiritual walk. Whether it's your prayer life, whether it's your meditation, if you're a Christian reading the Bible, if you're a Muslim reading the Quran, if you're a Buddhist chanting, if you're a naturist and you're out there going out into nature more, whenever it seems like things get heavier, that's when you should rev up and ramp up <laughs> your spiritual walk. Not in a way of where you ignore reality, but in a way of where you're saying there's something bigger than this and I have possession of it for my peace. And that is my spirituality. So I was meditating I was praying, I was reading transform transformative material, I was doing all kinds of things to realign my heart so that I didn't allow all of the negative spirit to impose and take over me to where I was just mad and angry and lashing out and just crazy. And so on a spiritual level, there is a spiritual deficit that is going on. So many people are so controlled and consumed and operating from everything physical, things that they can see. They're operating from the physical. And your physical, your body wants to eat, your body wants to be healthy, your body's going to do things anyway. So it's very instinctual, it's very, very carnal, it's very, very, very just fleshly, if you wanna put it. You've seen that in the Bible, <laughs> those are my Christians. It's a very fleshly life, but you can't live on flesh alone. Man cannot live on bread alone. There's more to it than just the, the physicality of it. And then I've also seen people distorting reality. There's a blurred line between things that aren't true and things that are true. And so, and so truth is at a deficit. And I say spiritual truth. Spiritual truth is at a deficit. 
And, and, I, and I'm left to question why it is, but I don't have to question it. People are just forgetting who they are. People are forgetting from where they've come. We are all spiritual beings having an earthly experience. You've heard that before. I think Wayne Dyer said it, Deepak Chopra said it, uh, Eckhart Tolle said it, Oprah said it, Iyana Van Zandt said it. A lot of people have said, said it. Uh, we are spiritual beings having an earthly experience. We all come from one source energy. There's only one God that operates in many forms, many facets, however you want to experience God or not experience it by, 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 by claiming that it exists, you can be an atheist and still experience some version of the spiritual presence that is. A bright idea. A breeze of air. The awe of nature, even though it has mechanics and it works in a logical, well-orchestrated way, that's still something bigger than this reality that we have. On levels that we cannot see nor explain. But we're all from that same force. We're all from that same spirit. We are from that same lineage. What has happened is we've forgotten that. And because we've forgotten that lineage, we don't see each other like we see ourselves. You know, the golden rule is to do unto others as you would do unto yourselves. Love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? But we can't do that because many people don't even remember themselves on a spiritual self, let alone to allow somebody else in to see the familiarity of themselves within that person. We are at a spiritual deficit. For those of you who want to know my, my version of hell, that is hell. I ain't, it ain't fiery for me. <laughs> it ain't no place down at the bottom of the earth that's fiery for me. It is a place of spiritual deficit. A place where you cannot, you do not feel, because I don't want to say you cannot connect, because you're always connected, but you get to a state of purgatory in which you do not feel connected to divinity, connected to spirit, connected to life, to love, to each other through that unifying presence that some call God, some call spirit, some call source. But it's that force that connects all of us. And we're at a deficit of that. So we're literally in the purgatories of our own doing. But there's hope, right? I ain't gonna take you to hell <laughs> and then leave you in hell. There's hope. There is hope. When you turn on the light, when you light a candle, when you have a bright idea, when there's good despite the bad, that is evidence that no matter what, there is still hope. There is still hope. You can reclaim your heaven. You can reclaim your salvation. But it's a choice. Instead of seeing somebody as an enemy or as something different than you, See somebody as you want them to see you, in love and in kindness. Be open to the realization that you might need to step back for somebody else to have their moment for the greater good. I'll use Jesus as an example. Jesus died early. Jesus' ministry was three and a half years, actually. We have the situation when he was a kid up to about when he was 10, and then it fast forward to him right before he gets baptized at 30, and he dies at 33 and some change. Numerology, numerology all in there. So you Google some numerology, 33, all that stuff. My life number, path number is 33. Um, it's, it comes out to six, but you look that up. Numerology is deep, deeper than just the number. But Jesus' ministry was only three years and some change. If Jesus was selfish, being who Jesus was, you know, it could have been a life, we could have heard a lifetime of Jesus' ministry. But we only got the three years. 
And then everything else that became Christianity, that became westernized tradition, thought from that, spirituality, westernized spirituality, came through those the torch was passed through. Paul, Peter, Timothy, and so many others, even still to this day. Why? Because there comes time when you move out the way and you let somebody else be the light and you bask in the light. We've got to learn to realize that we're all on the same team. We all got the same parents and we all are on the same team. But if we continue to operate at this spiritual deficit, in this carnal, fleshly, vengeful, selfish, instinctual way, we are going to be our own demise. You ain't got to worry about an Armageddon come from the sky. You ain't got to worry about some end of the world coming like people always want to, to, to portray in many, many religions and faiths and television shows and movies and stuff all over. You can be your own enemy. So you can be your own Armageddon. And if we don't get out of this spiritual deficit, the spiritual detachment from one another, the spiritual detachment from the higher power and from that all that is in existence, we will be our own destruction. So from a spiritual perspective, we got some catching up to do. And it ain't 10 years. I know every generation say the next generation is worse. It ain't 20 years. It ain't 30 years we got some catching up to do. It ain't when you were pulling people 400 plus years ago on slave ships, we were beginning to dig our way into that deficit. When we were waging wars all over Europe and parts of Africa and Asia, we were digging us that deficit. So you got centuries of deficit. But we know, they knew. We got, we got historical precedents that spiritual deficits don't work. So why don't we listen to the history? We humble ourselves and we take in the coaching and we renew our spirit. So yes, people storming <laughs> into the nation's capital profoundly said something to me and to many people. And the biggest thing it said to me is, we got work to do. Don't let this be a moment that we allow to just pass as yet another negative thing. See this for what it is, a moment for us to wake the hell up before it's too late. And I know we can. I believe we can. I know that there's love. I love you. I know you love me. <laughs> we love each other. We love our families. We love our friends. We love humanity. Let's do it again. Let's demonstrate it. Let's work remembering who we are. 